in television and outside broadcasts, the camera, cameramen point and frame the shots, but they do not expose the camera. The camera exposure and colour matching is done from within the OB truck, and in this vehicle, the two positions either side, the engineers operating there will adjust the exposure of the camera. And which is the, the iris in the it, camera. Which is the iris. And you needed to expose within perhaps a quarter of a stop to be, because you're not just exposing an, a camera, you're, you're matching all of them together, which is obviously more critical than just an individual one with no comparison. And then in the middle here, we've got a colour balance panel for each camera in use, and you've got red, green and blue knobs, because they're the three primary colours in, te in television and lighting. And you've got the dark controls for the dark bits of the picture, which are called lift, and gains for the bright bits of the picture. So if you want to, um, to adjust, uh, uh, if, it, if the picture is looking a bit cold, i.e. blue, um, in the brighter areas, you may take a bit of blue gain down and increase the red gain to compensate. And that's a process of continuous adjustment throughout the entire program for each and every camera. So it's a busy time, especially if you're outdoors in a, with nice fluffy white cumulus clouds going in front of the sun, you'll get at least three stops change in exposure and you'll try to hit a target of quarter of a stop and you'll get a big change of colour in, at the same time. It, it equates to um, a film in that the processing, you know, you, know, you had your ectochrome which was a bit bluer uh, than the Fiji, but it's the same sort of thing. You were basically processing the film, except it's not film, it's electronic. So we're changing the colours here just as you do when you process a film. In modern terms, it's probably what's considered grading. So this is yeah. live grading. And with early generation cameras, it wasn't just that the electronics were unstable, but the performance was such that there were variations when the contrast of the pictures occurred, which required far more adjustment than modern cameras will ever need. The time we're talking about, each person would operate two cameras because that's all really you could control with two hands and that's why it was laid out the way it is and you'd constantly push these down and preview each camera in turn constantly you were constantly going like this and then opening and closing the iris depending on where the camera was showing a player under the shadow of a stand or it might run into a bright part of the pitch and it was a constant case of monitoring all the time because if he, the viewer at home doesn't understand that the player has gone into a dark patch and he can't see the player. The human eye can cope with a contrast ratio of 500 to 1. These cameras can only cope with 30 to 1. So we've got to constantly help and that's why it needs individuals like us to decide on what the viewer at home wants to look at. It doesn't matter that the, the stand opposite is way out peak white, you know, and you can't define the stand opposite. They want to see the player with the ball in the darkness. So we're constantly having to ride that all the time. And we'll come on to the golfs. If somebody tees off at a golf course, the golf ball takes off from a fairly dark tee shot goes into the air against a bright sky, if we don't do our job properly, in other words, stop the camera down sufficiently, the cameraman hasn't got a chance of following the ball all the way from when it leaves the club head to when it lands on the ground again. You had to anticipate that as well, because yeah. um, there, there's a delay between you adjusting and the, the camera actually responding. And so once, once you've gone into the sky, you immediately start to stop down because you've got to go from one end of the, uh, the knob to the other. Uh, and you don't want to overdo it either because when it comes down again, then suddenly all the blacks will be crushed and you wouldn't see the ball again. So you've got to bring it back up again. So you, it, 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 that was the, uh, uh, probably one of the most skillful yes. uh, pieces, yeah. you know, that, that, the difficult OBs really to deal with as far mm. as exposure was concerned. Luckily, 
the players being professionals, he could judge where the ball was going to land. So if they did lose it in the air, you made a pretense just ease out. and then sort of go down to the ground, pull out wide, and one of the comments say, oh, it's on that knoll over there where previous shot went sort of thing. So you get away with it from that respect, but more often than not, you would have to try and help the cameraman as much as possible. And if you had a very good cameraman and a competent racks operator together, the cameraman would zoom in very tight on the ball as it went up, but he utterly relied on the racks operator exposing it properly so it, it was invisible, and he would then hang on to it, and the very best cameraman had got a ball that was you know, a quarter of the size of the picture right through the sky. But only a small number of them were sharp enough to do that, and it was a team game. You've seen the size of these cameras. To, to actually physically get these pound up in the air was a lot of effort, and to follow a ball that close yeah. was a, an extreme sort of physical... To do that all day long, and you might be on top of a hoist as well, rather than a fixed rostrum and this hoist to be swaying around in the wind and everything else. And going back to the shadows, there were several well-known locations that got their own sort of names and, and were well-known for difficulties at different times of the day. There was a very well-known Twickenham shadow where half the grandstand shadowed the pitch. And until even quite recently, the centre court and number one court at Wimbledon had very difficult conditions late afternoon, early evening, very, very difficult. So this is where it's black on one side because of the shadow yeah. and it's white on the other. Well, it's, it's uh, green well, on the other if it's grass. Uh, and if you've got a player who's kicking the ball across this shadow, then you've got to make sure that you can see not only the ball, but also his face. So it's a judgment thing. And then when he kicks it the other way, it, it would be overexposed. So it'd just be a white ball uh, and the grass would all be almost white. So you've got to then stop it down. But then you've got to know that, is he going to kick it that way or not? And, and it, uh, it, there's a, an awful lot of, of judgment, which is, and we were engineers. We were trained as engineers. And the difference is, we, were, we now were becoming operational engineers. Which is More a, a artists, sort of in a way. Breed, yeah. Breed. Yeah. yeah. I mean, one of the, one of the most uh, clearly, most obvious demonstrations of that was Wimbledon, when you got a shadow across the centre court, virtually across the, set, the net in the middle of the court. So you have one half blazing bright, and the half near you, usually. Very, very dark indeed. And you were making the call on whether how that was handled. It was a compromise. It was the least worst, really. Yeah, yeah. yeah it was yeah. making the judgment of the compromise. Uh, of course, if it, if, if, you, if it went wrong, there was a, a shout on production talk about, you know, camera one, what are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> well, I think one of the areas that we've had a lot of problems is when we had long cable runs across places like golf course or up mountains, the cable was supplied in 200 foot lengths maximum, and these PC-80 cameras were eventually modified so they were run up on up to 5,000 feet of this, which is 25 sections. And this is a 101-way cable. So there is considerable scope for the odd fault to appear on that. And there was no way initially of assessing where in these multiple joints the fault was. Yeah, and every single pin has got to work. Yeah. I mean, some obviously more important than others but who knows which one's going to go faulty. So. so there was a tender, what we began to do on golf courses and things was put a camera body on a golf buggy and drive down step by step down the cable and check each joint until you got to a thing. And you would then, the first basic maintenance would you'd always spray it with a cleaning solvent at that joint. And if that cleared it, you were out of trouble. If not, you would have to get the riggers to take another length out and you would have to get that changed. Of course on a program as well, we, we weren't using the amount of cameras they use nowadays. On, I'm told that they use 28 <coughs> cameras on a, on a big football match. If this was doing a big football match in those days, it would be five cameras. Yeah. Normally, it was only equipped with four. There, there's a gap after, after this rack where there, there was another camera, but we shared that. With, we had three scanners in Manchester, we only had one camera which went between yeah. the two, and whichever was the most important football match that we were doing that day, that got the camera. Um, and then, of course, obviously, we were controlling two each, 
So you get an extra engineer because you had an extra camera. And the good old days was another ex uh, example of where we had five cameras. But that was rare, really. And then if we wanted more cameras on a Golf, they would join scanners together. So we, <coughs> on a Golf, there may be four scanners in different areas of, yep. of uh, the, the course. It was generally things. accepted that the fifth camera was your working spare. Yeah, yep. that's right. And if it worked, that was great. If it didn't, yep. well, you have to get around the problem and just work with the four yeah, cameras. But, and the cost of some of the early equipment was remarkably high. We got the first ever handheld colour radio cameras into Britain, developed by CBS in North America and then made by Philips. And in Britain they converted one from the American standard to the British PAL standard. And the BBC got two of these initially, and the cameras and their base stations cost $200,000 in 1969. These, these vehicles were about £300,000 when they were built. Now you could buy a house for seven, £8,000 then, but 300000 for the, gives you some the vehicle, idea, really. to put in perspective. Which, yeah. which is part of the reason that we only got four or five cameras and that the spare was precious and was swapped between vehicles because it, it really was capital intensive. But even 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 though it was all it, it was you know a long ago, we never lost an OB. As far as I can remember, never, we never ever lost, lost an OB. We always we, made the deadline. We always made the yep. deadline. I mean, I've been on big on programs along the way where we've had generators stop on us, and we've had to get stuff back together and operational. And on one occasion, we got power back on the trucks at Silverstone, 12 laps before the end of a Grand Prix. Uh, no pressure. <laughs> That is our job, is what we call first line maintenance, in that we can find other ways around the problem if need be. Because of these trucks being so flexible, there's, you can bypass systems or re-plug it if something goes faulty. And that's the skill of our job, really. We're not there changing components. We couldn't do that. We haven't got the... Um, the spares or the equipment time. of time. time. Yeah. But it was just get it working. I think the other thing is that the, the, the vehicles were um, designed to have a spare of anything that was really important, like a pulse generator, um, which you, you can't run without a pulse generator. Um, so we'd have two of those. Um, and the, we had sufficient spares of cameras. So as well as having a CCU like that, we'd have a certain amount of spare boards as well, which we could swap uh, if necessary. So the, the, it was designed knowing that things will break down, and it was it really, as you said, really it, it was designed to be overplugged and changed. And, yeah. Uh, we would carry a, even a spare set of camera tubes, yeah. the red, green, and blue tubes, because often they would fail, and we may well have to change them in not very good environment, i.e. upper rostrum in rain or whatever. And you're trying to keep these things clean, scrupulously, dust free, uh, and it might be pouring with rain. And some directors sort of say, well, why can't I see this camera? Well, we're just changing the tube on it. But that was a major task. Yeah. It was, but we did do it. Yes, yes. I've had to change a tube upper rostrum uh, on a race course in the rain, but... With cold it was, fingers. <laughs> it, uh, it was not the thing to do. You could possibly help it, because they're so expensive. I mean, you'd, you'd have your nuttles wrapped if you, if you broke a pin off a tube. And it's just, it's like putting a valve in a, in a radio set, you know, except it's very fiddly. And not the thing, really, it should really be done on a bench. But we, we did it if we had to, to get it going. Well, this, it, this, this was the, the height of the technology at the time. It, um, it was the first major, I mean, there had been experimental uh, colour uh, scanners, but this was a, the, the, these were purpose built and they were the first generation. And I worked on this individual one. <laughs> and there so, were, this is CMCR 9. I worked initially as the second supervisor on CMCR 1 and accepted 7 and 8, which are the predecessors to this. And the last truck I worked on, I think, was CMCR 63. So there's a lot of progress over the years. 